Hi, I am Katie Groom. I am author in residence uh, right now for Cinema Moth Publishing and their uh, literary collections that they do monthly. Um, and I am going to read my short story that is featured um, and uh, it's called The Hermit. It is um, actually a short story that is part of the Cardinal Moon Saga universe thing and it takes place um well it gives more insight to things that happen in give us moon but this takes place many years before fixed moon um and again hugh and zoe aren't really involved with this so they don't know what's going on or anything like that so that's why it's kind of a separate thing that is dealt with outside of the story you know the um full-length novels so this is probably a point five, maybe um well i would say that cardinal moon is a point five, so maybe this is a point seven five. <laughs> so um so anyways i don't know how to number these things but anyways i'm gonna read this um and bear with me i'm gonna do one take also delta my dog is sitting next to me sometimes she feels like she needs to be the star while i'm filming these things so anyways enjoy the hermit solitude some may call it voluntary loneliness but silas called it peace he always had liked being alone perhaps it was because he was an only child or maybe it was that after his parents were gone his grandmother who raised him was always so much in his business that he couldn't even find the time or space to go to the bathroom on his own or and this was most likely it could simply be that silas just didn't like other people in general <laughs> he claimed he'd claimed some land in northern canada built a large house on it i'm sorry built a house on it <laughs> a small cabin one bedroom dug himself a little garden raised a few chickens things like that things that kept him himself sustained silas was proud of it not because it was his or because it was something he created himself no 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 it was because he actually built it himself without the use of magic he didn't draw from the shadows to move the logs when creating the walls for his home and he didn't use the darkness to till the small bit of land that would become his garden he did it all by hand and it was his no one knew where he was, and Silas enjoyed that. Other people were messy. They had their own opinions, they asked for favors, sometimes they wanted to go to do things out of the goodness of their hearts, but it was more likely that they wanted the other party to owe them. He had lived in solitude for many years, decades even. So when there was a knock at his door one evening, Silas started gathering energy before he even approached the door. Looking cautiously through the peephole, Silas recognized one of the other two people on the other side of the door from two different places his past and a wanted poster. The man he knew he, he knew had been known by many names in his life, Alfred, Frank, Philip, Callum, so many more. Silas wasn't sure what he went by at this time. Cautiously opening the door, Silas didn't even bother saying hello. He opened up with, what do you want? The man didn't bother responding. He just looked, locked eyes with Silas. He was dressed in a suit as if he had just come from the office, but his face appeared as he hadn't slept in a week. Forget bags under his eyes. He had an entire set of luggage. Behind the man was a woman with long, wild red hair. She, on the contrary, looked like she had slept a full eight hours each night and lived with the same amount of emotional stress, stress of sunshine or wildflowers. When she pushed past the man, the large pendant on her many necklaces clanged together. I'm Letty, she stated. And when she took Silas's hand for a handshake, his skin got pinched between two oversized rings. This is Victor, she motioned to the man. We've met. Silas stood his ground in the doorway. Liddy, Letty smiled gently. May we come in? Silas shrugged. While he didn't verbally give a real answer, he did move aside so Victor and Letty could come in. He figured that it would be easier to arrest them, arrest them from inside his home. Him, for debts owed to the council. The reward was quite handsome. Her, she would be punished for harboring a fugitive. He poured some tea and then asked, Okay, so how can I help you? Victor quickly shot a glare towards Silas. You're still in the bounty hunting business. Yep. The council is gunning for me and they're going to take me. Victor sighed heavily. I can't stop them. Silas so chuckled. You came here. You came to me. Do you want me to capture you and take you to the council right now? Are you eager to become imprisoned? No, Victor replied. I need your help. Folding his arms across his chest, Silas replied. That's rich. You parted ways with me because of the profession I chose. And now you want my assistance. 
who do you want me to find? And don't say someone on the council. As much as everyone hates those assholes, I'm not going to cross them and land myself in prison for eternity. Letty shook her head. No, it's not that, Silas. You're the best tracker in both our world and the mortal world, right? Silas smirked and agreed silently. Letty continued, so you agree that you could track anyone, no matter what the purpose? Shrugging, he replied, yeah, there's no one or nothing I couldn't track. Victor interrupted Letty before she could even open her mouth. Look, Silas, I need you to protect my daughter. Not right now, but in the future. I don't know exactly when, but Silas started laughing. So you're here not only with a hypothetical job, but you want me to protect, what, a three-year-old? Victor scoffed. She's seven, first of all. He pulled a picture out of his wallet and pointed her out to him. The council will stop at nothing to get me, and after that, I worry that they will punish my daughter to get what they couldn't get from me. You have to watch her at first. Letty is going to step... You wouldn't have to watch her at first. Letty's going to step in and protect her for as long as she can, but there will come a time when she no longer can. Letting out a deep sigh, Silas folded his arm across his chest. And what's in it for me? Money. There was no hesitation in his voice. I have lots of it. Too much. More than any one person should have. More than any family should have. I'll give you some of it. A down payment for agreeing and enough to cover twice the average expenses of a couple in New York City for each year that you actually watch over my daughter. And I'll set it up that it covers inflation. So yeah, money is cool and all, but I don't know that that's going to be enough. He started piecing. I'm going to have to take time out of my usual work to do this, and I don't know when it'll be. I might be in the middle of a big payday. Victor looked at Letty and then back at Silas. I had a feeling you might say that, so I worked on something that might be helpful for catching and holding on to your marks. Letty pulled a long vine out of her small purse, obviously an enchantment akin to Mary Poppins' carpet bag, <clears throat> and handed it to Silas. Silas looked at it and then at Victor. A fucking vine? Victor scoffed. You always judge, judge so quickly. Silas stared, glared at him. I judge quickly? Me? You're the one that sent me away when you found out that I was going to work as a bounty hunter. He shook his head in disgust. I'm honestly shocked that you would even entertain the thought of seeing me again, let alone actually putting your daughter's life in my hands. Victor nodded. You're right, Silas. I did abandon you. I truly regret that. He sighed. You are very, very best at staying hidden. But being right beside some you're the very very best at staying hidden but being right beside someone you're an extremely powerful warlock i own the only one that i know of that draws this power from the darkness he pointed at the vine i've enchanted the vine to only answer to you once you tie someone in it they will not be able to get out without you releasing them this piqued silas's interest show me to show you that I'm confident in my enchantment abilities, you can tie me up in it. Victor stood up. I want you to tie it with a bow tie or something that's ridiculously easy to get out of. Silas wrapped the vine around Victor and then simply twisted it. Okay. Victor reached down and tried to undo the twist, but was unsuccessful. Letty, come try. She did as requested, but they refused together. Silas, all you have to do is think that you want to release them and gently touch the vine anywhere, not just the knot. Silas bent over and picked up a piece of the vine on the floor and thought, release vine fell to the floor. Wow, that's very interesting. That could be beneficial. Victor and Letty stared at him while he was deciding. Silas wasn't going to fall into their tactics, so he excused himself to the bedroom and shut the door for a few minutes. When he came back out to the room, he looked at Victor and said, Victor, when I first became a part of this world, you helped me when no one else would, and I am still grateful for that. Yes, I will help you. Let's make this deal official. Glancing over at the dust falling slowly through the moonlight, Letty motioned for the moonbeam moon beam to come to her. As it broke free from the rest, <clears throat> she spun her hands around the moonlight, molding it into a scroll. The contract that the two men had made was written upon the page. Silas, in exchange for the vine and the financial payout, do you promise to protect Victor's daughter with your life? Letty floated a quill pen to him. <clears throat> Silas glanced over the picture of the little girl. He couldn't figure out why Victor would think that anyone would want to bring harm to this little girl with bouncing red curls. But money would set it, but the money would set him up for a while, much more than a reward for Victor's capture would. Beyond that, the vines could, in his hand could hold anyone in place unable to be released without Silas's conscious decision. This could greatly improve his already successful business. Reaching up and grabbing the pen from the air, Silas moved towards the scroll. scroll. As he signed his name, the words from the scroll lit up, their glowing likenesses floating towards him. As they got closer, they shifted, and at first Silas was confused. Then he recognized a few words, ad infinitum. The contract had translated itself into Latin. <clears throat> Silas watched as the letters followed each one, each other one by one, sliding their way under his sleeve. His free hand quickly unbuttoned his sleeve, and Silas rolled it up. He felt the letters still push 
through between his arm and the fabric of the shirt, continuing to wrap around his arm. It almost tickled. And they laid down one by one until the last ones placed themselves onto his skin. The contract has tattooed himself on him, tattooed itself on him with the last words placed on his index finger. The rest of the contract created a path up and around his arm. He made two mental notes. One, check himself in the mirror to see how this new addition would mess up his plans with his sleeve of tattoos. And two, that was the least painful tattoo that he had ever gotten physically. He was unsure what the mental and emotional implications would be. Letty turned to Victor and the pen floated towards him. And you, Victor, promised to set up an annual payout to Silas for each year he protects your daughter in one lump sum today. And you promised to relinquish the power in the vines you created for Silas for as long as your daughter is alive. Victor nodded and quickly signed the contract, sending the words to leave their mark on him. Barely waiting for the process to complete, Letty clapped her hands together once and the scroll closed and directed itself into Letty's hand. The pen dissolved into dust. She looked at Victor. Should we be going? While this place is safe, it's probably best to get you home to your fortress. With a nod, he replied, yes, but I have one more thing to ask of you, Silas, and you can say no if you wish. Hadn't Victor already asked enough, Silas folded his arms across his chest. Go on. I would appreciate it if you were the one to take me in. Not today. I have a father-daughter da father fun day planned with my girl this weekend. Silas softened, relaxing his arms. I'll think about it. I won't tell you my I won't tell you my decision though. Keep it'll keep you on your toes. Plus, it would keep Victor from blowing Silas's cover by being comfortable around him. Letty wasted no time in teleporting her and Victor away, leaving Silas alone. And there's like three stars because this is the end of that scene and start of a new one. That Saturday, Silas made his way to Pittsburgh as he had a lead that placed Victor and his daughter at the Pittsburgh Pirates game that evening. Silas found them walking across the Clemente Bridge and he watched as Victor held his daughter's hand tightly as he handed her some money to put in a saxophone player's case. Silas was shocked that a seven-year-old could hang for the entire game, honestly. It was obvious that she just wanted to spend as much time with her father as possible. Keeping to the shadows, Silas followed them to their car and he even followed them as they drove, teleporting at times to keep up. It was when they were nearing Latrobe that Silas sensed another supernatural being nearby. He was too late to interfere. The warlock had already conjured something into the road, causing Victor to swerve and hit a puddle. The car went sliding out of control, heading towards a collision with a large tree. Thinking as quickly as he could, Silas pulled from the shadows nearby, crashing crashing through the glass of the rear door door driver's side window and shooting across to hold Victor's daughter in place. Silas, and probably anyone within a 20 mile radius, heard the shriek that came from the car. That little girl's lungs were so powerful that her scream overpowered the sound of the horn. The shrieks shook the ground around them and then Silas watched as the car reversed in time. Then the impact undid itself and the car folded, unfolded as the as the car went slightly back to where it had come from. Then it collided again and reversed and collided again and reversed. At first, Silas stood frozen and then he realized what was happening. Someone was trying to reverse the accident. He transported closer to the car. No, the little girl cried and pleaded, I can fix this. Silas could feel the desperation in her screams. The car started to reverse, but with each cycle, it was losing its power. It moved less and less until it stopped. Silas peeked into the car. Curls of red hair provided a curtain between him and the girl's line of sight. Her hands were covering her eyes and she was sobbing, but suddenly everything fell silent, save for the horn. Panicking, Silas ripped the car door off the hinges and reached for Victor's daughter. He was relieved to see her chest still rising and falling, even though it was shaky with residual sobs at some points. Her eyes were closed and she was slumped over in her seat. She had either exhausted herself trying to undo what had happened or passed out from shock or perhaps a combination of the both. Silas picked her up and removed her from the car just as emergency vehicles were arriving to the scene. He ran towards them with her in his arms, knowing that he had no other choice. There's a man, the driver in the car. I pulled the girl, the girl from. Before he could finish the sentence, the car burst into flames. Silas lost the ability to speak in that moment. Sir, sir. Did you see what happened? Were you in the vehicle? A police officer was trying to get Silas's attention while a medic was trying to take the child out of his arms. As firemen made their way towards the car, Silas turn, turned towards the officer in slow motion. I just heard the car. He stumbled over his words. It hit the tree. I ran over to check. The 
girl, he felt a weight leave his arms. He knew he wasn't going to be able to stay at her side. They would never believe he was related to her. There wasn't even the slightest chance that he could even pretend that she resembled him. Sir, you saved this little girl's life. For a moment, Silas went to ask about Victor, but he stopped himself. No mortal could survive flames like that. They would have made fun of him for even asking. Silas wasn't even sure that there was any magic that would protect Victor in that moment, or even if it was needed. He could have died on impact from the tree. A police officer asked some more questions and recorded Silas's personal information, which was made up for the records. She handed Silas a card. I know you said you only heard the collision, but if you think of something else, give us a call. He nodded slowly, so she smiled softly at him. You're free to go home, Mr. She looked suspiciously at, at Silas. Mr. McMichaels? <laughs> He nodded and turned away. As soon as it was safe, he teleported back to his house. Sitting on the couch, he rubbed his temples. Victor was right. They would have stopped at nothing to get him. And they didn't care if his daughter was collateral damage. In that moment, Silas's contract became more of a vow in his heart than a business deal. He wasn't going to let anything happen to that little, little girl. He wasn't going to leave her unprotected, even if it meant kidnapping her and bringing her to live with him. He began planning how he would train her to harness her powers. He got up from the couch and started to prepare to head back to the Pittsburgh area when there was a knock at the door. Cautiously, Silas started towards the door, charging the power within himself. The knocking started again. Silas, it's Letty. Open up. Silas looked through the peephole to make sure she was alone and then let her in. What are you doing here? Letty ran into his arms. They got him. That awful counsel got him. I know. He held her as she cried. I know I was there. I couldn't stop them. She stepped back. The mortals, their doctors are trying to put that sweet little girl in a behavioral institution, saying she's experiencing a mental breakdown from her trauma. Her mother and I are not having it. What can I do? Letty shook her head. Nothing. I'm going to take an active role in her life until I'm no longer able, and then I will come to you and you will take over. Understood? But I think I can be of some help. She put her hand up like a stop sign. You will wait until I send you a signal. Understood? When, when he nodded, albeit reluctantly, she got up to leave. Letty, wait, the, the girl, the girl can mess with time. She turned to him, sun magic? What leads you to believe this? She kept reversing the car and the damage after it hit the tree. He ran his hand through his hair. Her attempt, it was too late, and I don't think she knows how to harness her power. It exhausted her. To reassure him, she took his hand gently. Then I will have to teach her. In the instant that she dropped his hand, she was gone. The cave cabin was silent, and for the first time, Silas did not welcome the solitude. The solitude made him worry for that little girl's life.